on Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, one of America's leading urban public libraries, delivering exceptional services and programs with a mission to improve lives and build a stronger community and by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. Virtual reality and building in virtual reality can keep up with the pace of my mind in a way that's really dynamic. So I think it's just, it's become my sketchbook. You know, what I do for clients right now is when I'm doing a mural or what have you, what I'll do is I'll bring them into the virtual space and they can see what that mural looks like on the side of the building and all the inspiration that's around them. You can see it in, in movies where they show these screens that are an array or a patchwork or a collage of, of all these different pieces of inspiration. And what I'm doing is putting them in a position so they can really taste, touch, and engage the content in a whole new way. And that's the way that I think my brain naturally wants to work is in three dimensions. I started painting, but before then, I was always building and making and sculpting. I, I was that kid who sat in a pile of Legos and was building an entire world then. So the fact that I can do that and there's no limitations and there's no offput of, of material, that's, it's, it's perfect for me. Nick Napolitano is a painter, muralist, and designer known for hyper-realist works filled with allegory and symbolism. He uses the human figure as a vehicle to explore and document various facets of the human condition. His paintings can be found in galleries and museums internationally, including the collections of Amway and the New Britain Museum of American Art. He recently exhibited at Gerald Melberg Gallery and the Mint Museum. Nick has expanded his work into the fields of augmented and virtual reality. In this episode, we explore figurative painting, public art, augmented and digital worlds, and managing a monkey mind. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Nick, welcome. Hi, how are you? I'm great, how are you? Wonderful. Nick, could you describe some of your work? So the work that I make is typically born from a realistic place, right? So I'm, I'm dealing with subject matter that is what you would see on a day-to-day -day basis and framing it in a more specific, curated way, right? So situating objects from your day-to-day -day life or people that you would see on the side of the street in a way that paints a a uh, very different picture uh, and spring is a springboard for another conversation. But what would people see if they saw your work? So I, I kind of run the gamut. There's three different trajectories of my work. So I have, you know, the more classical traditional approach that's all done with, with oil paint. Although I do dabble a little bit in acrylic, then there's the larger public works that are uh, done in spray paint or just traditional roller paint. And then uh, there's another branch, which most people don't know about, which is tech-centric work. So working in virtual reality and augmented reality to create um, visual experiences unlike anybody's seen before. Those are approaches, mm -hmm. but what would I see? In, in looking at the work, most of what I do right now is born from a figurative starting point. I would see faces and human bodies. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So faces, human bodies, there's a lot of other allegorical pieces that go into stuff that is is realistic objects right but isn't born from the uh the figurative origin point on your website mm -hmm. you describe your art as stylistically in line with mannerism and high renaissance what does that mean so the work that I i'm doing that is of that breadth and measure is really born out of allegory right so creating narratives that have a lot of symbolism um patchworked into the visuals right so how could we take various symbols or individuals and, and frame them in a way and, and put them in a context that is going to expand another narrative. And how is that mannerism and how is that high renaissance? So 
high Renaissance art and Mannerist art really was dealing with that language. That was the the centerpiece of what they were doing was was trying to um, have really contemporary conversations within a framework that's familiar. So like figurative work, right? It just allows people to access content that is otherwise difficult to discuss or hard to engage with. Your work has also been described as in the hyper-realist classical style. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that before too. So for me, my work has always been a, a challenge or a problem to solve, right? So from the get-go when I was learning how to paint and trying to teach myself like old practices, I wanted to set myself up against the highest standard really. So uh, I started kind of putting myself in problems where I had to deal with a very difficult task. And I wanted to do it in a timely manner. I, I'm pretty competitive with myself. So it was like, okay, look at the best of the best and see how I can pit myself against them, see if I could hold my own at certain benchmarks that they had, right? So Bernini, uh, Michelangelo, Caravaggio all had made works at a certain age that I wanted to be measured against, right? So like by the age of 21, I had certain goals and, and standards that I wanted to meet to say, if I'm going to pursue this, I need to be at that certain level that's competitive that you know can hopefully stand the test of time. All those artists painted in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. Yeah. Uh, we're in the 21st century. Mm-hmm. Art today is measured differently. Sure. I think that was just a starting point, right? So when I was learning, I wanted to kind of uh, traverse history and see if I could paint like what I thought was at the time, technically the best, right? And then from there progress and have conversations that are a little bit more modern. So that was just sort of the initial framework by which everything was was born. It was the springboard by which I could um, really engage the art world as a, as a starting point. We've used some terms that describe some genres in painting, like mannerism, high renaissance, classical style. Mm-hmm. If someone described your art as Norman Rockwell meets the renaissance, <laughs> what would you say? I went to school originally for illustration. I think the way that he played with narrative was playful, interesting, and and suited the context in which it was presented. I wouldn't view it as a, an assault on, on my visual work. I think a lot of the public work probably sits comfortably between that space, frankly, because the conversations that I'm having are probably in the vein of, or, or dialoguing between those two worlds, right? This, this day-to-day life and also something that is deeply entrenched in art history. Rockwell was criticized uh, as drawing sentimental illustrations mm-hmm. that didn't push the form forward. Mm-hmm. If someone were to say your work is sentimental craft, technically amazing, but not art in a critical sense, what would you say? I would say that most of the work that I'm doing right now is, especially on a in a public way, is built for the public that's digesting it, frankly. So I, when I moved to Charlotte specifically, I waffled with what I wanted to make public work about and, and how complex or how detailed a lot of the content would be and, and how controversial I wanted it to be. And for me, I really... Um, had to commune with this idea of, are you making the work for the public so the public can advance in a in a dynamic way? Or are you making it for yourself? Are you making it for the larger spread of art history? Are you trying to paint yourself into history? And for me, I think what I came to the conclusion was, it's it's more important for me that the work itself at this point is moving the community forward. And if that means the work is coming from a place that's more Rockwell-esque, then that's okay. I mean, a lot of what I have to do is I'll, I'll create notebooks and pages and pages of, of content that I'll distill down to something that's a little bit more simplistic or um, I, I, I don't want to say surface level, but easier to engage with, right? Is that a long way of saying that you're simply appealing to popular taste? Um, I don't think so, because I think at large, it's important that a community sees work that is is relatable and can frame their own lives around, right? So when you're making public work, it's for the public, first and foremost, in, in my mind, right? Trying to appeal to popular taste. That's an interesting framing. Well, let me run this by you. Good art challenges expectations. Sure. Art challenges an audience with both an idea mm-hmm. and with form. 
in that respect, great art can be initially challenging and confusing. Does your art challenge the viewer? So there's two different conversations to be had. The work that I'm making for independent clients that I'm making for museums, I think that's a, a more involved, symbolically rich image, right? Those, those images are built to give back as much as you're willing to commit the time to. I think the public work is, is a different context and therefore handled much differently. How are you handling it differently? In that I don't think they're embedded with as much complicated symbolism where you have to, you know, have a encyclopedia next to you to try and unpack all of the content. Like most of the the work that I'm doing for museums or what have you, it's it's it takes six months to a year to really build all the content together and have it have this internal dialogue that is cohesive. The public work is its its role is different as far as I'm concerned. It's interesting that you're drawing this distinction between public and private art. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the role of public art? I think for me personally, the role of the public work that I'm making is to try and move the community forward and position itself in a way that is going to engage the public to have conversations that need to ha be had, frankly. Like I think we need to promote positive change with the, the work that we have. When we have an opportunity or a massive wall, it should be specifically trying to drive positive change in some capacity. And if that means the message has to shift a little bit so people are willing to engage with it and have it be a cornerstone or a pivot point, then absolutely. If the art doesn't challenge the viewer, how does the dialogue move forward? Well, I think, you know, we're, we're speaking to a variety of different levels of individual as far as knowledge about art history, right? So it's important that people can access it who don't, frankly, have an art history degree. I mean, that's the biggest thing is it needs to speak to or be accessible to some degree by every man or woman. Is it enough for public art to just be beautiful? Uh, that's a conversation that I have with myself frequently. Uh, I don't think so, frankly, but realistically, probably yes. In, in some terms, I mean, I, I don't, meaning will people validate it? Will the public validate it as something that is an asset to the community? If it's just beautiful? Probably. Is it what I think should be the standard? No. What do you think should be the standard? I think the artwork that we see in public should be, again, a cornerstone or a pivot point for positive change. So there should be an idea in the work beyond simply its inherent beauty. Absolutely. For you, what is that idea? Uh, it's different with every piece. So before I tackle a work, I, I try and understand the context, where people are going to be seeing it, what demographic is going to be engaging with it, and their move and try and build an image that is most well suited to the context in which it's placed. Can you give me an example? So the women's empowerment piece, for example, right across the street from the McCall Center, that was built specifically for that wall and that setting and what was happening at the time with the Women's March and, and trying to, uh, I was having a lot of conversations um, behind the scenes to try and see what, what sort of image needed to be made at that period of time and what would be the best tact and uh, approach to build an image like that. And even if I was the right person to do it, given my, my gender, obviously I'm, I'm a guy, so is, am I well suited to have those conversations? And, and frankly, is it more important to see an image dialoguing with that stuff and, and less important who, who does it, right? So I talked to well over 60 women before even trying to start start with that project and a variety of other people to see if I was well-suited to, to build an image like that. And how intense and how symbolic the content would be was a large conversation. So that mural is actually designed to be augmented and all the ribbon or the paint strokes actually have an augmented expanded component of it where there is narrative components that are, are more involved and more content rich. But at the end of the day, it's only going to be digested in that temporal space once it's projected on. The image itself, its its day-to-day -day life exists just as it is, you know, seven women's faces on a wall of all different ethnicities and all different, all over the LGBTQ spectrum. You are commissioned to do public art and you are commissioned to do private art. Mm -hmm. Which do you prefer? Both need to be happening to keep me fulfilled, frankly. I, I tend to be pers a person who is, is 
in their head too much. I, I want to take things to a cerebral place and it's taken me a long time to try and back off that. You know, like I said, when I'm building a work, there's tens to hundreds of pages of research that go with it. And to try and shut that off, to try and turn to a place where we can distill something down to something that's easily palatable and, and digestible for the general public is is not within my normal habits. It's, it's just not who I am. And it's taken me a long time. And how I uh, live in general tends to be of that mindset, right? This monkey mind that's constantly thinking of every situation and playing off all the hypotheticals and overanalyzing things. And through yoga practice and meditation and a variety of other things, uh, I've been able to kind of silence that and realize that I need to put these things in a larger context to take a macroscopic view and realize that the work needs to be positioned for the public that is consuming it, whatever that may be, or whoever that may be, rather. If your public work was unfettered mm -hmm. and representative of your monkey mind <laughs> and of the complexity of your thinking and, and allegories and metaphors at its best, what would that public art look like? Oh, geez. I'd probably, you know, spend a year and a half making one work that was very intensely nuanced and would have to have a budget that could allow me to continue to live um, and <laughs> support me exploring all of those things. Like, it's just not practical, frankly, to try and in the public sphere, do ultimately what I'd like to do just because of, of timing and, and resources. One day? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's already happening in some capacity. It's just, you know, merging all these worlds together. So we can begin to spend a year or two on one project. Nick, who is Mike Todd? Mike Todd is my well, work partner and brother. He's the closest thing to uh, a family member that's not blood related. So him and I are part of a design or he's the other half of my design group called two form. We build a whole array of different projects together and he's, he's a really, really fascinating character. One of the projects that two form is working on are paintings that have a augmented reality component to it. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So Mike Todd and I met, I want to say a little over two years ago through a mutual friend who was basically shaking both of us to, to meet each other. We had been, the other friend and I had been building some work together. And every time we were around each other, he was like, listen, everything that you're talking about is the conversation that Mike's having. It's about time that you're introduced and need to, uh, get in a room together. And within five minutes of meeting each other, we were talking about quantum entanglement and it was like, okay, now we need to start a larger conversation and we were off and running. So we started building all of this work together. And what, what came from that, uh, with his background, he's a programmer by trade and has done a lot of work with people like MoMA or groups like MoMA and, um, a lot of performance work that deals heavily with technology. So, and obviously I'm coming from a, a background in traditional painting. That's what most people know me as, but I also prior to that was going to school for architecture and had experience with CAD program or CAD design. So I very much was familiar where our worlds or it was a, an easy bleed over between where, you know, his world started and where my world ended. And the content was just, uh, it was really organic in how uh, the relationship started. We were all thinking and talking about the same things. How is it that you're painting augmented reality into flat space? It's happening in a variety of different ways. So all the murals that I've done over the last year, maybe a year and three months, uh, are built to be augmented, meaning they were designed from their inception to come to life in an expanded way. So we're doing that through a variety of different technological approaches, one being projection mapping. So uh, if you can think about all the murals, as three-dimensional objects, right? I'm building situations where these objects exist in real space, and therefore we can modify that space and all the objects in that space to our liking. So that means we can make, you know, the women on the women's empowerment piece talk, move, shift, come to life, share their stories through projection mapping, and you don't need a handheld device. We can use scanning devices so you can modify all that lighting when you're in front of it. So it's, it's really, the technology is allowing us to expand 
all these pieces in a way that's really different and no one's ever seen before. And it was something that we've developed really from the ground up. Help me understand how that works. Essentially, if you can think about like in, in a CAD program, how you would build just like you build a house, you can build any three dimensional space, right? And your perception of that being three dimensions only exists if you can move around it, right? Engage it in a three dimensional way. But our perception optically functions like a flat image. So when I'm looking at you right now, if, if we weren't moving or shifting or changing, there's no way to really prove that you're a three dimensional object in a three dimensional space. So the murals essentially are built in a similar fashion where we're placing objects within a room, right? Or a space. And therefore we can, modify it after it's frozen or, or built into a still in any way that we see fit. One of the ways that you create the illusion of three dimensions on two dimensions is to use perspective. Sure. How is what you're talking about different than that? It's, it's using perspective, right? Everything is built with a vantage point in mind because it is a fixed vantage point. So like if you think about it, especially with long murals, the way that we go about approaching something and, and giving it the illusion that it has three dimensions but is seen from one perspective is is playing with optics in a really interesting way, meaning it, it's creating a world around your viewer. So a lot of the designs, especially on these bigger pieces, are when they're sculpted in, you know, artificial space wrapping around the viewer, right? They're, they're kind of a, a visual hug around the viewer's uh, optical space. And therefore it functions as a, you know, a, a flat two dimensional image when it's, it's being painted. But in actuality, the 3d space that's being used in artificial reality is, is a very different look and feel. So it's, it's hard to see without, um, I'm using my hands a lot to describe this, but it's hard to, to, to visualize the perspective in which it's built. How do I see the augmented reality without a digital device? Projection mapping technology, which we use at night, is essentially a way of throwing light onto the wall or throwing a screen overlaid onto the, the painted surface to expand the image in a way that is, is essentially an illusion. It's, it's fictitious, right? So it's, it's, it's dialoguing with the content that's on the wall, but it, it is its own entity. It's just a projection that's adding content to the wall. Essentially, but it's more complicated than that. So because of how we're building it, typically when you're throwing it at a two-dimensional surface, it has to abide by the two-dimensional edges and framing, right? Because we're building a world first, we're building an expanded space or a the depth of field into the image, it can do more than a typical projector could. So the, the, the features in the murals are all sculptures. All those women are, are physical three-dimensional objects before they are painted, right? And everything there, we can, we can move them around, we can expand them to function like you or I could. Is this new? Yes. No other artists are doing this that you're aware of? In the way that we're doing it, no. Uh, projection mapping technology has existed for some time, but we've designed the way to um, dialogue with the objects in a way that is our own. I'm very, very excited about it. <laughs> what future do you see in it? So the reason why we started doing this in the first place was to try and use language that is of our youth, right? You think about all these children that are engaging with these handheld devices on a day-to-day -day basis and their attention spans, frankly, are, you know, five to 10 seconds, right? Social media has really created a, a situation where people uh, have to have their attention caught rather quickly, otherwise it's, it's gone and passed. So we wanted to kind of use a language that is familiar to the younger generation to engage them with something that is is a static image or or uh, you know has this this richness in content. I think when we're doing the projection stuff, it allows them to think about what an image can do in a whole new way, and and ultimately gets them off this square device that's uh, occupying all of their their time and energy. I wonder if Broadway's been doing this for a long time. I don't know. A have they? <laughs> I mean, if you think about a stage, uh, mm -hmm. three-dimensional characters, the creation of backdrops, and then lighting and projection, is the effect the same, or are we talking about a different effect? 
Oh, I see what you mean. Um, I guess conceptually, it it is sort of creating a setting that is contained, but obviously they're not using technology yeah. in the same way. I mean, it is it is a part of the larger conversation, though. I think that's pretty interesting. I haven't thought about it in that way. Yeah. It's casting light on a three dimensional stage. You're casting light on a on a three dimensional mural. Yeah, with three dimensional objects that are all interacting with that three-dimensional space right. like we could put butterflies or you even onto one of those murals without you know a second thought we've spoken about the projection of augmented reality on murals but you are also doing work in virtual reality what is that work the work that we're doing right now is is in headset right so an htc vive if if anybody's engaged with that, is this new technology that you put over your eyes to create a simulated space, right? You could venture to, you know, Acapulco or some other place in this this virtual reality. And uh, what we're doing is essentially building worlds that are our own. Uh, we've been beta testing with Google for almost two years right now and building spaces that really are born out of an ideology that Mike and I have been working on for the last two years. Right now, we're building sanctuary spaces or almost um, a spiritual spaces that are born from a language that we've been developing. It's kind of hard to describe without throwing you into the space, but uh, the easiest way I can describe it is we can make a microscopic picture a cell, on a cell level, a sculpture that is of someone's face or of a, a deity that we've created, taking that and expanding it to 40 feet high. And, and an entire world that is, is built of these microscopic dots that are ever expansive, right? So hundreds and hundreds of these sculptures that exist within a world that is infinitely large, right? The scale is, is something that's completely adjustable in the virtual space. So what we wanted to do is create a, a place where people can meditate on their own existence and the scale of things in a way that's really, really intimate. Why did you choose this space of meditation and sanctuary? I think because my, my brain is working a mile a minute and I'm building so many things, it allows uh, virtual reality and building in virtual reality can keep up with the pace of my mind in a way that's really dynamic. So I think it's just, it's become my sketchbook. You know, what I do for clients right now is when I'm doing a mural or what have you, what I'll do is I'll bring them into the virtual space and they can see what that mural looks like on the side of the building and all the inspiration that's around them. You can see it in, in movies where they show these screens that are an array or a patchwork or a collage of, of all these different pieces of inspiration. And what I'm doing is putting them in a position so they can really taste, touch, and engage the content in a whole new way. And that's the way that I think my brain naturally wants to work is in three dimensions. I started painting, but before then, I was always building and making and sculpting. I, I was that kid who sat in a pile of Legos and was building an entire world then. So the fact that I can do that and there's no limitations and there's no offput of, of material, that's it's, it's perfect for me. And I have a real issue with, we were talking about this before, but material culture and, and how, as a maker, you're always producing more stuff or creating more waste. And it's part of the reason why I have a real difficult time making prints is because it is this massive amount of, of stuff that you're making that you don't know if it's going to be consumed necessarily. So that's sort of what led to the virtual space in the first place was like, okay, if we were to remove all the physical materials that you're using right now, what would you be left with? Can you still make and create in a way that's dynamic? Nick, you gave an interview to Charlotte Five in which you were asked about where you find inspiration. And you answered Nordic design. Mm -hmm. How does Nordic design influence your art? I think it's really just the design principles, right? So this marriage of utilitarian function with aesthetic beauty, I think there's a few cultures that really nail that. And that's really what I seek to do with my work. And I think it's an expansion of what we were talking about earlier is the work's role within a community. So it's a pretty natural extension of their belief system. Biophilic design is, is something that is, is definitely in line with that, where you see nature, right, married with the human hand building all of these, these things. Uh, I think that's what I've been trying to work towards. You know, a lot of the work that I keep to myself isn't, I guess, is more in line with those values. Uh, I think uh, it's it's more the the work that I'm painting publicly is is kind of an example of what you're describing where the work gets distilled this this messy notebook gets dialed into an image that seems like the most concise vision of of what needs to happen in that space. Where did you grow up, Nick? 
I grew up in Colchester, Connecticut. It's a, uh, a small podunk town in Connecticut by Norwich. We had a, a cow pasture by my house. <laughs> <laughs> what was your life like growing up? I was born of, of parents that were of two different worlds. So my dad is uh, an engineer by trade, a brilliant man, a workaholic. And my mom is uh, probably the most empathetic person I've ever met. She's got a, a huge heart and uh, she's a school teacher. So yeah, that's, that was my childhood in some, the marriage of both of those pieces. I feel like that's ultimately what my, I don't know, I'm a pretty, both myself and my sister are a reflection of that odd marriage. What do you remember seeing as a child? I, I kind of want to give a, uh, there's, there's two different answers that I could probably give to that. I remember laying on the ground as a child, staring at the clouds and, and moving cloud shapes into my own imaginary world. And I would do the same thing when I was sitting in the back of the car, stare out the window. My mom always used to say I was a, a pretty quiet, contemplative kid and it was because I was constantly building and making and changing the world around me in my mind. So I guess that's, <laughs> that's in some who I've become. Are there other things you remember seeing as a child? I, I'm thinking of my parents and, and their interactions. I'm also thinking about just watching bodies move, frankly. I mean, I was a, I was a gymnast for a long time and I used to watch you know, just people move and shift and walk through the world and how their bodies engaged with the world. And that was really fascinating to me. So that again, probably relates to the, all the figurative work is this interest in, and how people traverse space. When did you recognize your talent as an artist? So when I was going to school in high school, as I mentioned before, I was focused on architecture. It seemed like it was going to be a perfect marriage of, of drawing and building, which I had, I'd been dabbling with for some time. And it seemed like a way to, you know, have a sustainable career where you weren't a starving artist. I did that until my junior year in high school and realized it wasn't making me happy and everything had shifted to computers. And I didn't want to spend 12 to 15 hours a day on a computer. And I really wanted to do hand drafting. And I had an art teacher at the time that was She'd become a rather quick mentor because I really wasn't taking many art classes prior to that. And art had kind of been put on the back burner. I had drawn a little bit. My my grandmother was was an artist and ran a gallery in Cape Cod. And it, it wasn't something that I ever took that seriously. But I, was, I would sketch fairly frequently, especially with building buildings. And uh, as things progressed and as I talked to this teacher, it realized that it was time to shift focus. And it was between music and art at that point. And... Music is so dependent on so many other people. I mean, I had been playing in bands all throughout high school, and it was it was just not something that I felt like I could really rely on. So I rolled the dice on, on making art. So the back end of my junior year in high school and my senior year was spent building a portfolio, kind of throwing all my eggs in one basket and seeing if I could get into school doing that rather than what I had planned on doing prior. And from there, it just kind of exploded. I got a, a good scholarship to go to a college and, you know, I was off, off running. <laughs> the university was a really interesting setting for me because I was enrolled in so many different classes and was really focused on building my own program. Uh, I had um, spent a lot of time in the sculpture studio building large kinetic sculptures and, and other weird devices, which I guess speaks more to, again, the builder in me than the, you know, traditional painter. But what did I learn? I think it was confidence in my expression, art history, understanding of design principles that really wasn't, you know, emphasized in high school. I guess it just started to give me, it started to open up doors in the art world that I just didn't realize existed. I traveled a lot while I was in school. I spent time in Italy, which again, clearly is an influence and, and that, you know, created this magnifying glass of what really could be done. I had a recent conversation with Marek Reines, a professor of art at UNC Charlotte, and he said being an artist is a posture, a way of standing in the world. What do you make of that? I think that's a really interesting way of positioning it, and I don't think he's wrong. 
I think a, a lot of what being an artist, and I, I don't even technically define myself as an artist. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a nice, easy shorthand, but oftentimes when people ask what I do, I just say painter because usually they think I'm a house painter and it's an easier way to kind of brush off the, the question. But I think the way an artist moves through the world is very different because they're oftentimes, I think, focusing and digesting things in a way that's completely immersive, right? They look at things and they want to unpack and it's very curious and, and exploratory. Who is Fred Wessel? Fred Wessel is an egg temper painter that I studied under uh, both at the University of Hartford and over in Cortona, Italy. Brilliant, brilliant guy, a critical teacher, and really pushed me to learn the technical skills of painting. It was my really first real dive into painting and it was it was curious to see how he processed color and, and processed approach uh, and again gave me a platform to start exploring a little bit more for deeply where art could go he kind of started planting the seed as far as where painting could go it was him and uh, another professor jeremiah patterson but really most of the work that i did to learn about painting was done through self-exploration and reading blogs and books and just trying to figure out how to do things because the the program that I was in really didn't teach traditional oil painting. And at the time, I didn't know where else to access it. So it was just kind of excavating the internet for information and trying to find one or two books. And there was one painting where I basically taught myself how to oil paint that was the springboard for my career. You graduate from Hartford. What did you do next? So while I was in school, I basically built a career for myself so, or built a full-time job. I had uh, spent my summer, I think of my junior year, making one of the most difficult pieces I think I've made to this point yet. So for me throughout life, I've always tried to put myself in these corners and, and paint myself out or try and find a way to, to solve the problem. So over that summer, I had a studio in Hartford, Connecticut and took all the money that I had and poured it into making an eight foot by 16 foot oil painting that uh, after two months was, we, I drove it out to, to Michigan and it uh, sold in an art gallery after two and a half weeks. And that gave me the money to really jumpstart my career. That's a crazy story actually. Yeah. Uh, after that point, I, I just did what I do now. I, I made and I, I, all the doors kind of just opened from there. You moved to New York and became a full-time artist. Mm -hmm. What were those years like? It was intense. New York is a, a really interesting place. I mean, it's a it's a incredible space for for artists to exist. Obviously, it's it's known internationally for being this mecca. But for me, the environment was really harsh. I mean, cloudy skies, you know, half the year is is not my cup of tea. You know, six months of winter is is not what I can you know, deal with to sustain. So it was, it was difficult. I mean, I think from a cultural standpoint, it was unbelievably enriching, but from a personal standpoint, I grew up in a place that was enshrined with nature and to go to an environment where there was really no access to nature and my, my allergies, frankly, like my body rebelled against the city. So it was only so long that I could stay in an environment where, you know, my physical being was, was responding adversely. So where did you live in New York City? Union Square, 18th and 3rd. How long were you there? Almost two years. What happened next? So after living in New York, I did a tour of the South. Uh, I had lived in Atlanta and Athens prior, and I wanted to move back to warmer climates. So I came down here and I uh, did a basically a tour for two months and settled on moving to Charleston. And I had been porting out of Harrisburg because I have some family there. And I had a friend who was actually in Charleston for an event who basically encouraged me to explore Charlotte a little bit more intimately and brought me to Snug Harbor, actually, during breakdance night. And I, I love to dance. I'm, I'm a big fan of being in your body and expressing yourself in that way. So I got there and I was like, oh, my God, there's a whole bunch of creative odd people who are gravitating towards this space. And this is what I need to be around in Charleston has flavors of that, but not quite to the degree that Snug really offered. So it's like, okay, well, if this is the cornerstone of my experience in the South, then let's try and see how far the, the rabbit hole goes. How has Charlotte been for you? 
Charlotte's been brilliant for me. It's treated me really well. It's it's welcomed me in with open arms in a lot of ways, and it it's been really responsive to what I wanted to do. Once I kind of got my footing, it took me about a year to try and convince people that I could make work here. It was really difficult to try and dive back into the public sector. I had been making public work in other cities, and it wasn't nearly as hard to try and find your footing in those cities. So for here, it was like, okay, what do I need to do to try and earn credibility and show that I'm I'm a worthy contributor of the city? Nick, I have a series of short questions for you. Is there a recurring dream you have? I keep having this dream of an ex-girlfriend that I had in New York and her life now, and I, I, I go into her space uh, she has this beautiful apartment in New York, and she's making all of these ridiculous knickknacks that she's selling on on the internet for ungodly amounts of money, and it doesn't make any sense to me. It's like this weird whirlwind of bizarre overlaps that I, I still haven't positioned. Like, I don't know what the dream, if, if you believe in you know dream science, what it's trying to tell me. But, I mean, it's just these weird, hand-sculpted, bizarre creatures that she's sharing with everybody in this dream. I, it's very strange. <laughs> what is a question on your mind these days? How can I be most effective in my community? What delights you? Dancing, playing music, being in the natural world, and traveling. What truth do you want revealed? Whew, that's a good question. What truth do I want revealed? Of the many things that I do and and build, what's going to be the most effective? I, I have this internal conflict all the time um, that's basically begging the question, am I being the most effective version of myself by making artwork? Frankly, I am a natural maker and I think building things is is incredible, but I always wonder, you know, is, is time best suited doing this or building houses in Africa or doing something that's, you can see the the results of your your work in a, a way that's real tangible, right? There's a, a real A-B connection between your between the work and, and how you're contributing. I think in the art world, it's a little bit more difficult to see that. And I think that's been the, the question is, how can I build work that can really be a platform for change and is actually affecting change? What is a vision you have? That Charlotte becomes a cultural hub on the East Coast. What are you certain about? The people that I surround myself with, uh, that I can rely on them and depend on them to be constant figures in my life that are, are going to be a positive influence in my existence. I, I've been really, really conscious about the individuals that I tend to align myself with. I, I've heard this, this quote that you are essentially the average of the five people you spend the most time with, and I'm a big believer in that. So the people that I spend my time with are all unbelievable, amazing people that I think are a thousand times better at what they do than I am. What draws you in? People who have a, a positive energy about them. You walk into a room of individuals and usually there's one or two that sort of have this resonance. They, there's a physical draw to people who are living their best life in a way that that just sort of have this glow about them. So I would say when you see that, when you can taste that, if you're hypersensitive to it, it's beautiful. And those are, I guess that's the, the natural pull is towards individuals who are, are honest and true and, and trying their best. What matters most to you? Integrity. Yeah. Thanks for your time today, Nick. Absolutely. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it. You bet. Nick Napolitano is a painter, muralist, and designer. He earned a Bachelor's of Fine Arts degree at the University of Hartford, Connecticut. And now, a personal word. As I sat across from Nick Napolitano, I thought of Leonardo da Vinci. I imagine Leonardo explaining his art to a journalist or at least trying to, as the journalist busily scribbled away. Leonardo would be in one of his studios in Venice, Florence, or Milan, surrounded by bronze castings of galloping horses, 
half-built floats and carriages, altar pieces of the Virgin and Child, walking mechanical lions and iron and wood automatons, architectural blueprints of cathedral domes and palatial estates, military plans to defend Italian cities, sketches of parachutes, flying machines, and tanks, notes on astronomy, botany, mathematics, and cartography, drawings of fetuses in utero and nerve endings in the human brain, etchings of muscles and kidneys and cartilage and skeletons, models of dissected cows, birds, monkeys, bears, and frogs, movable bridges and barricades, hydraulic pumps and mortar shells, Thousands of notebook pages of coded descriptions and findings written backwards. Maps of entire cities drawn to scale. Murals of battles and biblical scenes. And a few paintings. The Mona Lisa, The Last Supper, and the Salvatore Mundi among them. That redefined perspective, light, color, figurative composition, and gradations of tone. The journalist, overwhelmed, would ask Leonardo to describe his work, and Leonardo would stare ahead, unable to find the words. I have not seen Nick Napolitano in his studio, but I imagine sketches of murals, commissioned oil paintings on easels, spray paint cans and rollers, props and objects, projection mapping software and devices, computer terminals and laptops, and virtual reality goggles and headsets. Leonardo worked from dawn to dusk without stopping for three or four days at a time. He often refused to eat in the throes of his work. Nick claims that he is immersed in his projects to the point of exhaustion. Of course, it is high praise to compare Nick to Leonardo. But listen to his own ambitions as he compares himself to Bernini and Caravaggio. Nick is measuring his technical skills against the greatest masters of the Renaissance. However, the test for Nick will not be his command of the brush and the human form, whether he can mimic the masters. The test for him will be what he has to say, whether his art makes a statement about the human condition, about what is true and real, and what is beautiful and ideal. If his art advances form, if it advances an idea, then he is on his own footing. By every fair measure, Nick Napolitano is doing just that. His murals reflect on community, on inclusion, on acceptance, on who we at our best can be. His digital worlds invite us into mindfulness, into renewal and contemplation. Such is art. There is a book on my desk called The Power of Art by Richard Lewis, professor of art at Marist College, and Susan Lewis, professor of art at the State University of New York at New Paltz. The first chapter of the book talks about what art can do. It can bring faith to life, expressing the deepest and most tangible beliefs of a culture in material form, such as the Notre Dame Cathedral and the Sacred Mosque at Mecca. It can represent the ideals of a society, such as the statue of Athena in the Parthenon. Art can declare power and authority, as does the painting of Henry VIII by Hans Holbein the Younger. It has the power to shock, as did the work of Marcel Duchamp and William de Kooning. It has the power to touch our emotions, as do the paintings of Marc Chagall or the photography of Robert Maplethorpe. It has the power to awaken our senses, as do the works of Francisco Goya and Salvador Dali. Art transforms the ordinary to expressions that take our breath away, from the egg yolk tempura used by Andrew Wyatt to the found marble that becomes the Taj Mahal. Art is a pouring forth. It marks time. It defines ages. It says hello. It invites us in. It turns us away. It challenges who we are. It condemns and forgives us. It gives us grace. That's what I see sitting across from Nick Napolitano. That's what I'm thinking about as I scribble away. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. 
Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Go, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.